Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Creating Advanced GUIs for Low-Power MCUs with Qt. My name is Janelle, and I'm with the marketing group here at ICS, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we get started, as always, I'm going to go over a few housekeeping items. The presentation today will run approximately 40 minutes with time at the end for Q&A. All attendees are automatically muted. You can hear us, but we cannot hear you. You may ask questions at any time during the webinar via the Q&A dialog box. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation as time permits. And finally, recording the presentation will be made available tomorrow along with the slides. You will receive that via email. Okay, so today's presenters are Harrison Donahue and Matthew Ellis. Harrison is a business development manager for the Qt company and is focused on the growth and development of Qt for MCUs. He spent the last six years developing IoT products for consumer markets, focused on home, home automation, energy awareness, and connected security. And he is joined today by ICS's Matthew Ellis. Matthew is a senior software architect at ICS. For the last decade, he has been bringing customers' UX visions into reality across multiple industries. All right, so with that, let me hand it over to you, Harrison. Thank you very much, Janelle, and thanks everybody again for attending today. We've got some um, very exciting, very informative, very technical content for you um, that both Matthew and I are gonna walk through. So um, before we get into that, I wanted to give you guys, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, um, sort of a brief overview of the QT company and the technology that we offer. Uh, so you have some more context going into this uh, in case this is your kind of first run up against the framework uh, or the Qt for MCUs specifically. So um, our core product is a cross-platform software framework for application and embedded device development. Qt as a technology is a little over 25 years old at this point with the initial release in 1995 by a little company um, by the name of Trolltech out of Norway. Uh, from there, we went through several acquisitions from Nokia and on to Digia. And in 2016, we were spun out of Digia with the name we hold today, as you know us, the Qt Company, and became publicly listed on the Helsinki NASDAQ. The Qt Company today has uh, just over 350 employees spread out all across the globe. Uh, all of them committed to driving our technology forward through sales and marketing, R&D and product management, and our professional services organization that offers consulting uh, and development team augmentation, as well as all of the other partners we work with, um, such as ICS. So here's a look at our global footprint. Um, we, as you can see, our HQ is located in Espoo, Finland, and we have offices throughout Europe, Asia Pac and three here in the US. Our America's headquarters is in Santa Clara, California. We have an office in Boston, Massachusetts, where I am located, and another one in Detroit, Michigan. Globally, we have over a million and a half developers using Qt under both commercial and open source licensing. The applications and devices being created with Qt span across 70 different industries, from automotive to medical, uh, industrial to consumer and others. Within those industries, we have over 3,500 commercial customers, some of which that have as many as 100 licensed Qt developers and designers. Now, our global customer base is continuing to expand uh, really even more rapidly as we build out more tooling that's focused outside of the development and really geared towards the UI UX designer, uh, but for the sole purpose of really bridging that gap and optimizing the product development workflow. The need to provide excellent sales service and technical support is really our primary driver for positioning uh, Q professionals all around the world. So let's talk about Qt's core technology, the Qt framework, what's inside, what is it used for? The framework at a high level can be split into two major components. The first is a really vast collection of libraries with support for several language bindings. Our roots are in desktop GUI application development, and so several of our libraries and APIs are focused on just that, creating world-class GUIs and HMIs. Over the 25 years, however, we've really expanded our libraries to cover an expansive set of backend components and application business logic as well. Everything from networking stacks for Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi and serial drivers, to multimedia components, machine-to-machine -machine -machine communication through our Q for, um, Q for automation, file and OS management as well, just to name a handful. Um, we also have dramatically expanded the deployment targets. So while we continue to be a lead technology and cross-platform desktop application development, we also enable you to develop on and deploy to uh, mobile, 
web and embedded. And in the context of embedded, I'm talking about application processors or MPUs running in RTOS or OS, such as embedded Linux, all the way down to the humble MCU more recently. So as you can see on the left side of the slide, um, we support several language bindings. Our primary languages are C++ uh, and our own declarative UI modeling language called QML, uh, which has been designed specifically for really modular um, and portable UI development with an easy to learn markup style syntax that's really similar to JSON. We have a binding for Python as well. Uh, and depending on which components of the framework you're using or where you're deploying, you'll also see some JavaScript and HTML5. The second component of the framework is our tooling, which is really geared at maximizing the capabilities of the libraries and optimizing your product development workflow. We have tools for both designers and developers. Qt Creator is our um, cross-platform, full-featured integrated development environment, or IDE. It comes with everything you'd expect of an IDE um, with both a form um, and text editor with syntax checking, code completion, um, and all the tools that you need to create and configure projects, as well as automate your builds, your testing and deployment of your application. So in terms of developing your application, you can manually code up your UI, or you can use uh, the built-in drag and drop WYSIWYG or what you see is what you get, um, GUI designer, uh, that comes with a large collection of pre-made widgets, controls and layouts. This means that there's no more delivering design assets and a written specification for sizing, layout, and all of your UX interactions and animations. Um, we offer a bridge and uh, plugin tool for importing your design assets directly from Photoshop, Sketch, Figma, and Adobe XD. Um, once you bring your design into our design tool, Cute Design Studio, um, all of your asset sizing and positioning is going to be preserved and QML code representing your design is automatically going to be generated. From there, you can begin to tweak your assets, drop in more pre-made cute widgets and controls or animate your UX with our timeline editor that's built off of the Adobe After Effects look and feel to continue that experience of working in the native design tooling. The Cute Design Studio, the UI UX design suite, really allows you to preview your application live on the desktop through um, device emulation, as well as share it with your team to collect feedback and accelerate that UX prototyping. Design Studio will automatically create a project for you, which can then be opened in Cute Creator, where the developer can pick it off easily um, and continue to tweak the UI and build out and connect up all that backend application business logic. So now onto the component of the framework that's near and dear to me and which we'll be covering in more detail today, Qt for MCUs. So Qt for MCUs is a relatively new component of the framework with the initial release at the end of 2019. So now a year and a half later, we've pushed out eight minor, although really major releases um, packed with additional platform support, new APIs uh, and support for other vendor tooling and workflow optimizations. We're continuing to push forward towards version 1.9, which you can expect to see around the end of the summer and gain more parity with the upstream offering of Qt. The Qt for MCU's runtime engine, which we call Qt Quick Ultralight, is an entirely new runtime engine created from the ground up to meet the constraints around memory and processing power that comes with MCUs. You've probably seen attempts in the past to kind of shoehorn um, the MCU runtime engine into lower um, uh, lower power hardware such as MCUs, um, but this is a totally different approach. We came back to the drawing board and built it from the ground up. It leverages the best of both worlds with a declarative UI that's built in QML, um, and that's to provide the abstraction that really allows for direct code reuse on other platforms and a C, C++ backend for native speed in your application logic. Now, ultimately, your QML that you're um, defining your UI with is converted to C++ by our build tool during the build process, and you can absolutely see what's generated there and modify it if needed. In terms of the footprint, the runtime starts at around 80K. We do offer a host of optimizations to minimize flash and RAM utilization where it makes sense for your application. And that's largely what um, Matthew is going to cover here in the, the latter half of the webinar. The rendering engine will make use of any hardware acceleration where present. Um, so in the case of NXP, their pixel processing pipeline or PXP and on ST, uh, the Chrome Art accelerators, just to name a couple. If your platform doesn't have acceleration, most of our core APIs have a fallback implementation to CPU rendering. Uh, and we've put in the effort to really ensure that that's gonna be as optimized as possible. 
In terms of where you can deploy, we've really put a focus on supporting ARM Cortex M7, M4, and M33 up front um, for the widest adoption and availability possible. We support several vendor platforms out of the box for both automotive and non-automotive parts from Renesas, ST, NXP, Cypress, Infineon, and Xilinx. Um, but we also have a fully documented platform porting guide, which walks you through building up your own platform adaptation should you need another vendor or another part that's not supported. Uh, this also includes if you need to move to custom displays once you start to really build up your, your custom platform and get off of the EVK. And presently, we support bare metal and free RTOS if you are in need of a supporting OS. So how can you leverage Qt for MCUs and the rest of the Qt framework to your advantage? Through open source and free evaluations of the commercial licensing, it's really easy to get your feet wet and begin exploring the capabilities of the API and tooling, which many of you watching the webinar today may have already done. Uh, our large ecosystem means uh, not only that it's easy to find support for your specific platform, but also solutions to your specific challenges are really likely to be found on most of the popular developer uh, forums it's for my Stack Overflow kings out there, kings and queens. The accelerated workflow and maintenance um, experienced by our customers and users are really testaments to the low total cost of ownership that Qt enables and generally the high return on investment. With 25 years of maturity, ISO 9001 quality certification and vast industry and platform coverage, it means regardless of where you're deploying and what your application does, you can really expect stability and quality in every piece of Qt technology that you're using. Many of the markets our customers serve demand performance and scalability. And it's high frame rate, uh, easy to scale to other platforms and cover a variety of different um, pieces of hardware in terms of constraints and processing power. It is the highest priority of our R&D team, uh, performance and scalability, and second only to the quality and stability. Generally, our APIs are written in a way that offer a clear and effective path to tackling your solution, but we recognize there isn't always a one-size-fits-all approach. So you're never going to feel pressure to change your existing workflow or processes, but rather be offered ways to optimize them. Being cross-platform means never being locked into a specific vendor, which really gives you the power to remain competitive. When you choose to become a commercial user, you are entering a partnership with an organization that has a very clear business model that relies on your success. We do continue to invest in our customer success organization that puts a focus on your projects, your team, and your company overall, with a goal to make your offering the standard for excellence. So let's look at these advantages in the context of avoiding the common pitfalls and minimizing the setbacks that we often encounter in our development process. Most of these pitfalls are due to um, unexpected changes in requirements, time, or budget during development, right? But also sometimes due to a lack of user testing. We have a variety of libraries with APIs for quick implementation from UI widgets to backend networking stacks, as I mentioned before, which really allows you to get started quickly. The Qt Quick API based on QML really facilitates modular and reusable code, which allows you to pull from past projects or move more quickly should you need to change platforms. Now, in terms of resources, if you're in a sudden need for new heads, new developers or designers, uh, Qt has a really large global developer base. So you're pretty likely to be able to find somebody who's had experience working with it. Uh, and if not Qt specifically, then even more so uh, likely with C or C++. Qt's tooling and common API across the platforms really allows you to be more agile in your development. Uh, and this means you can shuffle members of the team around more easily as they'll be working with code they're already familiar with, even when they may normally work on a totally different platform, say moving from mobile to MCU. The ability to do device emulation and deploy in the form of an executable through the Qt tooling enables truly rapid prototyping and the ability to more efficiently gather that user feedback in the early stages. Now, having a focus on accelerating your time to market uh, generally puts our customers ahead of schedule and can really ease those scenarios where you lose significant time due to some of these unexpected changes. And then finally, being cross-platform and platform agnostic uh, means that you are never starting from scratch. So with that, I will pass it over to my colleague, Matthew, to dive into some of the really informative technical content that's going to further set you guys up for success. Thanks again for your time. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the webinar um, and I will talk to you at the Q&A. Over to you, Matthew. Thanks, Harrison.
So uh, let me just start off with uh, telling you a bit about ICS. Uh, so ICS has over 30 years of experience in user de interface design and software development across um, many high performance industries, including medical, consumer devices, automotive, to just to name a few. We provide uh, development services for a wide variety of technologies of particular relevance in today's uh, webinar, as we have a wealth of experience with uh, Qt. Uh, development and also we have our assistant company Boston UX who uh, provides user experience and visual design services. ICS is headquartered in Watham, uh, Massachusetts with offices in California, Europe and actually up here where I am in Canada. So I always like to start customer engagements um, by asking uh, why they chose the platform and kind of what are they looking to achieve? Some of these are typical answers I've received that may resonate with your motivations. Now, you want to keep your hardware costs low to keep your end product costs low. Um, you may be even reducing your hardware costs by adding uh, a touch screen for the first time. Uh, you may be, you know, it's a competitive advantage. Either your competitor has it uh, and you need to catch up or uh, you're, you expect them to have one in the future too. Uh, another thing is is kind of to differentiate your product line um, uh, from the other, other products in your line. But I find there is one important motivation that I find is left out when I ask this question. Have you thought about how the customer is going to use the device? More so on MCU platforms, do I come across customers who don't list a better user experience as a reason uh, to use an MCU with a touch screen? Now more than ever, user experience design is an integral part of product design. Smartphones have set the bar uh, for user experience, and now you have to follow suit on budget hardware. This uh, may produce some you know, struggles, um, and what the type of struggles you have will really kind of depend on your background. Generally, I put MCU uh, customers into kind of three categories. Uh, there's the customers who are scaling down from the MCUs. Um, so you may uh, already have a product um, that you need to uh, scale down. Um, so this is kind of your budget line uh, that you use in MCUs, but on your premium products, you have MPUs, larger screens and stuff. The second set of customers are those that are scaling up. Um, so maybe the lower end products are mechanical buttons interfaces, and this is the, you know, the, the premium product with uh, a touch screen. Um, another I group into this category are those who have, are evolving their product from a mechanical interface um, into uh, a touch screen interface. And then there's the final category are the veterans that have kind of been down this road before, uh, might have a few battle scars, and are in the second evolution of their product. Uh, I hope this uh, webinar will give you a little bit of uh, tricks to make your development faster and um, and quicker to market. So let's kind of talk about the development process and what we're going to talk about all three stages here today. So first off is your user experience design. This is understanding how your user is going to interact with your product. Um, and you know, present how they're going to do it. Um, visual design is going to get into more how the interface looks, the cues uh, for the user, and also this is really your brand identity. And then you know, the final part is the software development. You know, you got to actually make a product work and and functional. So that's what is in that. Um, the most important part of this diagram overall is this bottom arrow. This really shows it's an iterative process. Uh, there's no way you're uh, going to ever kind of guess exactly what the user wants uh, right off the, the bat. You need to you know, develop something quick, get in front of users, and you know, make modifications. So this is very important um, in MCUs because um, we're coming up against uh, you know engineering constraints of flash and RAM. So you may even, before you even get to a customer, have to iterate over your process to 
to uh, modify the designs and stuff like that. Um, and considering that these three circles uh, represent different people and sometimes in different um, teams, it's, it's good to make sure that they all are uh, working closely together and to get your product out, out the door. I've seen long delays and compromises in overall quality for uh, companies who have failed to recognize that these three individuals or teams um, need to work closely together. So let's uh, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, what is user experience design? A lot of times you see UX and UI inter used interchangeably. Uh, they are very much different. Uh, UX is really understanding how the user, uh, the task the user wants to do and how they are going to achieve it. Um, it's really understanding how your user thinks. Um, so it's about placing buttons where they can find them, can discover them, and you can also give them the feedback on, um, you know, it's actually done the task. A good ex user experience is going to delight your customers. A bad user experience is going to kill you. So it's a very important step. It really is the foundation of a good product. If you're new to user uh, interface design, I recommend uh, the book, uh, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman. Uh, this is a very light read and it uh, gives you a perspective of why um, good design is important. Um, and it gives a lot of examples with kind of everyday things. Um, after you read the book, you'll never uh, open the door the same because you'll know which doors are uh, designed well and which ones aren't. Um, and this is probably maybe even a very relevant read if you are uh, developing something that is considered an everyday thing. So now let's kind of look at um, user experience for MCUs. Um, there's a few um, particular ch challenges and it's, it's somewhat hard to talk generally about user experience because it's uh, very specific to your product and your customers. Um, but the first, there's a few things to look at is device location. So since we're embedding these the, uh, interfaces on all sorts of things, you kind of think is your, you know, is your product mobile? Is it static, like a, a thermostat's uh, stuck in the wall? Uh, or, you know, my oven that I can't move out of my kitchen, but other things I can pick up and move. Um, and also, you know, it could be, you know, height and uh, angle and stuff like that, indoors, outdoors, are all things you need to consider um, in coming up with a good user experience. Uh, you also have to factor in that you have smaller screen sizes um, and resolutions. So the, um, in some cases, you may also have um, technologies like resistive um, touch screens instead of capacitive, which is a little different uh, um, experiences because they're not as responsive as capacitive. All these things you have to factor in. And this is a, kind of an important one for that one bucket of customer I mentioned before of they're scaling down from a, an MPU platform down to MCU. Uh, um, th these are the challenges you're gonna kind of face in that. Um, and then you have to think about your uh, existing product. And this one's more um, important in those kind of going up from a kind of more mechanical displays to a touch screen. Um, it's how you represent what the customers knew before. You know, they knew where the late buttons were, what they did. Um, and now you have to translate that into a touch screen. And then you also have to think about performance. Um, don't ask kind of too much from your see a platform um, uh, or you, you'll have kind of frustrating um, customers, but it's also um, about providing feedback to the, the customer if there is something slower. So the first thing to look at is, is the, the device the right place for your, your task? Um, so you can offload um, uh, processing to other devices um, by using either a companion app or a web application. And this is becoming more and more common and people are, are more and more used to it. So I might buy a, an embedded device, but I also will download the app for it on my phone. Uh, and this also uh, kind of 
um, gets over some of the challenges of uh, of a device. So if I give an example of an oven, um, I may want to you know have recipes, and this is something you want to offer your customer. Well, sitting in my kitchen uh, at a display that's at waist level, browsing through recipes on a small screen is not really a great uh, user experience. But if you give me that ability on the uh, phone or on my computer, uh, I have I can sit in a more comfortable spot, browse the recipes on a bigger screen. I can also take the cell phone with me to a supermarket for groceries. And then I can send that down to the device and, and do the actual cooking. So think of it like an overall picture and, um, and then you can create a good user experience. Now let's kind of look at a, a, a use case here. So on the, the left-hand side, I have two screens um, uh, of the existing product and um, which is going to be improved to just use a touch screen. Um, so here we have kind of two screens. There's uh, something to set a temperature. Uh, you know, I have mechanical buttons for start, stop, uh, up, down arrows, and uh, you know, a uh, menu button. Uh, the second screen is the menu screen. The up and down arrows will let me select which one um, and such. So overall, on the right, let's look at this first screen. We have some nice improvements. The up down arrows are more really closely associated with changing the value. The start stop is, is there. Um, we're even able to do kind of larger uh, you know, numbers uh, for better visibility. Um, and then on the uh, menu side of things, we can show more items and, you know, users can click directly on them instead of having to scroll directly. Um, but what's interesting here is there's kind of one usability thing that was lost. If I'm in this menu screen, I can't stop the device. And this is something that you may not catch right away because you know, everyone who tested it will, will stop it and only ever go into the menu screen uh, when the device is off. But of course, your customers, for some reason, wants to get in here um, while they're cooking and that's when you find it out. So you, know, you could have gone you know, many months down the road before, uh, you ever kind of discover this. So kind of best practices for UX, um, share your design confidence early with engineering so that your engineering team can raise concerns um, about um, any of the concepts. If, if you, you know, find things that maybe you're not sure if it's going to perform well or how it's going to feel for the customer, is it, it's easy to create a, a prototype. This is where I'll um, you know, sit down with a UX or visual designer and we'll pull up uh, Qt the design studio. We'll come up with a quick concept, get it on a board, and then we'll start sharing it with users. Um, and and that, you know, that's the kind of last point is get it in front of users early. And users don't have to be external to your company. This is a great time to engage your sales team, marketing team, and kind of get the rest of the company, you know, involved is let them play with it and just sit back and observe uh, how they, they use it. Uh, you may find that maybe your buttons are too small or maybe they can't find the information and this is a good way to re uh, refine it before you get into uh, more high fidelity um, interfaces and stuff like that. So uh, it can really uh, reduce your design time. So now let's uh, start talking about uh, visual design. So visual design, you're gonna come up against your um, hardware constraints. So the first is uh, your, your flash, your, this is your storage, this is where all your assets are gonna go. Um, so your images and your fonts are gonna take up far more room than any of the code on the device will uh, typically. So, um, the visual designer has a major impact on uh, the use of, of the, the hardware constraints. And this also plays into the factor of uh, the RAM usage um, because uh, obviously this all has to be rendered. And um, depending on the visual effects you have, performance can be a consideration uh, as well. 
So let's uh, talk about kind of, you know, image uh, management. So uh, the, you can save flash space by collapsing images, but let's talk a bit about um, when to do that and when not to. Um, so on the, the left here, I have two buttons uh, with our uh, icon. We have a settings and a kind of a back one. Um, this is a, uh, a good example of um, when not to collapse images, because if you were to collapse it and you had the, uh, the background plus the icons, uh, you, your, your net uh, flash size is going to be uh, increased. So in this case, I would keep the icon separately and just have one background image. On the right are two examples of uh, that are good to collapse the images. So in, on the top one here, I have the red factory reset button. It's the only red button in my system. It's also the only place I use this icon. So that's a, a good um, one to collapse. Uh, and then over here, uh, the bottom two is that now the background is closer to the size of the icon. Um, I, I'm actually decreasing the flash size by cl collapsing it. Um, collapsing also will help with rendering because you've, instead of blending these on the target, uh, it, they're blended, you know, in the uh, on your desktop. So that's a great thing. These are pretty s simple examples, but you know, more complex one would be say you have a background image and you have a header bar, you can um, bake that header bar background into the background image, um, which will kind of save a lot of kind of memory and processing uh, time. Uh, also with these kind of simple um, examples I have here, another choice is you can use uh, the, the Qt's uh, native drawing for uh, a rectangle, um, to do the backgrounds, and then you don't even have to store the backgrounds in Flash. Um, so that's another opportunity there. So the next thing um, you can do is uh, remove transparency from your images. Uh, this is another way. So if you know your uh, images, uh, backgrounds are a great example. Uh, but if you also have uh, fully opaque images, uh, you can remove the transparency. Uh, here I have a screenshot from Photoshop. On export, you, there's a button that says whether to export transparency. So I would just uncheck this and it, it's gonna reduce uh, the size of your, your file, which is a great way to say flash. And you're not using that transparency anyways because it's a completely opaque. Obviously, if, if you have Transparency, you're going to have to keep that in uh, so that uh, the rendering of the, the, the Qt uh, engine will be able to um, do that blending. And you'll know if you got it wrong because you'll have probably a black background where you expect it to be blended. So another popular um, uh, technique that you see um, because of uh, made popular on iPhones and, and such is blurred black backgrounds. Um, blurring is uh, an expensive operation. So this is best uh, mm -hmm. to be done uh, in your design tooling. So the trick here is, as you see, like in this example, the um, overlay is blurred of the background. So what I've done here, you can see on the bottom of the screen here, is an image that overlays the unblurred background image. So you just kind of add this over top. And so all it is is just two images over top, but it creates that blurred effect. Um, and this is kind of a nice one to have that kind of fancy look, um, but uh, not um, kill the performance of your MCU platform. So kind of a final uh, one on uh, visual design it comes with kind of 16-bit displays um, uh, is your get color banding. Um, as an engineer, my favorite uh, way to get around this is I just tell the visual designer to avoid gradients, um, but that may not always be a uh, um, welcome uh, suggestion. Um, solid colors do can look uh, nice, but um, uh, it might not be what you're visually looking for. Um, so this the second technique here is you can take your image in uh, 
uh, like Photoshop, for instance, there's other things uh, I've used Photoshop the most. Uh, and you can add in a, a Gaussian um, uh, a blur uh, or a noise, I should say. Um, so you just like Gaussian noise and uh, a range between one and 3%, um, just kind of play around. So generate the image, throw it on a device and you'll quickly see. Um, hardware dithering may also be available um, uh, and kind of fix these problems. If it's not, or the performance isn't uh, what you desire, you can turn it off and use these techniques. That's a, uh, a very nice one to do. And that, um, I've had great results with this. So kind of final note on visual design is, uh, I find it's important to understand your key elements of your design. What, like what's ne negotiable and what's not negotiable. And uh, prioritize those things um, uh, so that when engineering comes back and says, you know, I can't fit all the images on flash and stuff, you, you know what you can sacrifice uh, quickly and kind of make that revision um, uh, quick. And so you're not spending hours uh, in meetings, trying to figure out what you're going to sacrifice going forward. Okay, let's get into development. Um, so I've hopefully uh, offloaded much of the work to the UX and visual design, so uh, to make um, my fellow software engineers uh, work easier. But there's still going to be some work here to, to do uh, to get a, a great performance uh, out of your Q for MCU system. First, let's look at images. So images by default in, in Q4M view are exported as um, uncompressed. Um, so this will save you in flash, um, which is great, um, especially in a low RAM situation. But if you, you're you also um, more worried about your flash space, um, you can use compressed images. Um, so there's kind of two uh, ways to uh, specify this, you can do it overall. There's a, a, the QL default compression on, you set these in your CMake, and this will compress uh, all your images by default and export them. Of course, this is going to use a lot more RAM. Uh, you're more likely to use uh, the second one uh, where you're going to um, kind of tune it per image. So you can specify on each image whether you want it compressed or not compressed. So if it's, you know, so maybe something that you're not using very often, you can compress it. Um, things like backgrounds you may, may want to, uh, say on your main screen, have uncompressed and stuff like that. So you can play around. And this is a good way to uh, kind of tune it uh, to get that right balance between uh, RAM and flash for, for your system. Now, q mcu also gives you a bit of control of uh, here with um, how uh, the images are uh, doing. And this is kind of more of a performance consideration. If there is high latency from your flash, you may want to copy it in RAM. Uh, but this also uh, gives you some uh, flexibility if you have compression as well. So the first um, uh, uh, parameter you can have is never. Um, this is for um, uncompressed. So this will render your images directly from flash. Uh, so no um, RAM will be harmed in the, the rendering of the, uh, this um, image. It will be all from flash, which is great for uh, low RAM. Um, and then you have kind of two other options. Um, so you can load all your images up at startup. Uh, so you're going to need a bit more RAM in that case, um, uh, or your, your kind of middle ground is on demand. Um, so this also, there is a, um, uh, an image a cache that you can configure. Um, uh, you know, we'll do that with on, on demand. And this is kind of probably the best middle ground of as you go through your app, you'll load up into the image cache uh, the images you need um, and, and uncompress them. So. So there's a lot that you can play around here, uh, and it's great to have this flexibility. 
so there's also a uh, few compiler hints um, uh, that they have. So if you know your uh, rotating or scaling images, um, you can apply these hints. Um, this uh, allows uh, the compiler to optimize for rotations and scaling. Uh, there are kind of multiple things going on under the hood here, and it, it depends a bit on your hardware. Um, so by default, if I know I'm going to rotate or scale, I'll, I will turn these on. Um, and you know, if if you, uh, one thing to say with scaling, uh, this is something you can also do offline too in the visual design um, to to save RAM if that if that's a concern. Uh, so in fonts, um, uh, you have two options for rendering uh, uh, for front engines. There's the static font engines that um, exports your um, glyphs as um, uh, bitmap images. Um, and then there's the mono uh, type spark engine, uh, which is your uh, kind of rasterized, uh, what you would kind of normally uh, be used to on higher end platforms. Um, they got a full features suite of um, uh, font support here. Um, Static font engine is going to be good if you are on those low um, RAM situations because uh, like the parameters we just showed you in the images, you have that same kind of control with, with fonts of rendering straight from Flash and stuff like that. Um, monotype is going to be a little bit better if you have lots of glyphs, um, uh, especially for internet isolation and stuff. I would tend to go that way. Um, so lots of flexibility there and it definitely won't be hindered on uh, your ability to display fonts. Uh, so, so yeah, um, another thing for kind of performance, uh, you have a hardware layers. So this is available through a component called layer. So you can throw um, stuff into the um, these different layers. So for instance, here in this diagram, the background image, uh, is static, so this can be loaded from Flash, um, and then uh, the the, uh, the four squares here are kind of more dynamic. So, uh, what's nice by putting them on layers is it's a smaller footprint of your display that's being rendered, which is going to be faster. Uh, and you can also start to play around with. Um, uh, your, your frames per second here. So uh, in this example, we have two dials that are um, fast, like your speedometer and RPM, but your gas gauge is going to be slower. So you can actually set the uh, frame rate to be a lot slower on this uh, to optimize your uh, performance. Um, you can also specify your uh, bits per pixel. So in this middle one with the indicators, um, you can reduce the bits per pixel because all that's changing here are, are colors. Um, so you can go kind of to an alpha map type of uh, image in this spot to kind of also save on rendering. So that's all we have. And now we'll open the floor to questions. Great. Thank you, Harrison. And thank you, Matthew. Uh, so like Matthew said, we are now open for Q&A. Uh, looks like there's been some coming in. Is there anything uh, ready for you, Harrison? Sure. Um, yeah, we got a lot of great questions today, actually. So thank you guys for those. Uh, and thank you, Matt, for the content. It's uh, highly informative, a lot of good stuff there on optimizations around Cube for MCU. So um, we've got a couple more uh, questions pouring in live as we go now that people have sort of digested all the information. But uh, to start, what is the difference between open and uh, open source and commercial licensing? Um, and so in the context of Cube for MCUs, um, there is no difference because Q4MC uses actually a uh, being a relatively new component of the framework um, is currently commercial only. Now, when you move up to the upstream flavor of Q, that's where the open source and commercial becomes more applicable. And the differences largely come down to licensing terms. Um, if you're putting this in a for profit product, if you, or if you are a university or somebody who's building a personal project, um, generally uh, it would be sort of restrictive to some of the libraries that you may have access to, depending on. Um, GPL versus LGPL, um, 
but at the at the MCU level, there's there's really no difference because uh, it is commercial only. Um, with that in mind, when you come to do and do an evaluation of Q for MCUs, um, you will have uh, access to the source code for the plat up or the I'm sorry the uh, platform adaptation. Um, while you won't have direct access to the source code of the runtime itself, uh, but you'll still be able to look at the all of the API documentation uh, and, and use the the Q Quick components and have all of the um, supporting source documentation within that, as well as seeing the C plus plus right that's generated by it when you build. Um, Next question here, are you speaking at all with Silicon Labs uh, to work with their ARM uh, Cortex Gecko microcontrollers? Uh, personally, worked a lot with Scilabs and Nordic in the past. Big fan of their parts. Um, I think the problem with some of the Gecko parts presently is just the available size of internal flash and RAM. Now, if you can put something um, external to that or your application is really simple, um, there's a good chance that there's some compatibility there. I know that we have customers porting to Nordic. I don't know that I've personally seen anything on Scilabs yet, um, but certainly uh, a hot target for the IoT uh, and smart wearable space. All right, this next one, could you share some cost comparisons against competitors or estimate uh, to develop a demo embedded MCU applications? So this is a customer um, a question rather that comes up quite frequently um, in webinars and discussions with customers. Uh, I will say it's pretty hard, as you can imagine, to sort of pinpoint an estimate on what it would cost to develop um, an application in terms of, uh, I guess, competitive frameworks. There's plenty of options out there from totally free and open source things like TouchGFX um, to other commercial solutions like Qt. Um, I think that where people tend to not factor things in immediately is um, the general return on investment and leveraging the tooling to really get ahead of your schedule. Um, and, and that translates to things like hitting the optimal market window and not showing up uh, late to the game with a product that somebody else has done. And now you're in a competitive position, um, the engineering dollars, right. That it takes, if you can get um, your application up and going in a week, you know, what does that cost you versus having to um, kind of manually hard code things? Also, are you sitting around waiting for um, support on GitHub um, where on the commercial side of things, you have a direct access to premium support um, and uh, people who are really experts in Qt uh, and the Qt framework. So there's a lot of things to consider there. I'd say, you know, come talk to us about your project. We'll try to figure out kind of the scope of it. Um, I've seen a lot get done with the uh, with the commercial evaluations, which is it's free to have an evaluation. Um, you just have to have a conversation with us and we're not so bad. Uh, so I would encourage you to come come have a conversation with us. Let's learn about your project and see how we can help you guys. Um, man, there's a lot of questions pouring in. So in regards to RTOS specific features um, and what do you support in comparison with the general OS, um, this varies on where you're at. So in the upstream flavor of Qt, um, with the commercial offering, you'll see Linux, QNX, Integrity VX works as some examples of um, RTOSs and, and OS that are supported. Also at that level, um, Qt provides libraries uh, for thread support, uh, sort of in the in the form of platform independent threading classes and thread safe ways of posting events like signals and slots connections across threads. Um, in general, obviously, multi-threaded programming is a very useful paradigm uh, for, for performing time consuming operations without freezing the user interface. Um, Qt also provides a resource system for organizing application files and assets, uh, a set of containers and classes for sort of receiving input and printing output. At the MCU level, we've got support for free RTOS, right? And in that context, um, we've done all of the work to kind of have the entry point to your Qt for MCU's application in the free RTOS context. Um, free RTOS itself, um, each individual thread or task uh, is consuming uh, or has its own stack rather. Um, so the amount of stack space that Qt Quick Ultralight needs is really largely dependent on the complexity of your project. Uh, but as an example, uh, most of our demos and examples use a stack space of 32k words. Um, the memory allocators provided by FreeRTOS, um, they implement PV port malloc in um, v port free. Uh, so these allocators are used internally by Qt Quick Ultralight platform ports. And in most cases, they should be used by the application code as well. There's a lot of more information if you guys um, want to go down the rabbit hole on this on the QT's docs page. So I would definitely encourage you guys to, to go to the docs page um, and kind of read up about specifically what you're potentially looking for, because we can go on for it for days here. Um, so the next question that I see here is, can you share more information on the QA ecosystem, specifically integration with other applications and full cycle support? Um, 
This is a great question. I mean, in terms of QA, I mentioned ISO 9001 certification. Um, what, you know, quality assurance in general with QT um, is a big focus and we service a lot of industries where it's critical, um, medical, automotive. Um, and so what having an investing in certifications like that means is that our source code and our internal processes, development processes have to be very transparent. They're certified by an unbiased um, uh, uh, body. And that means that all of that information is sort of re readily available to our customers and is often actually used in their regulatory processes. Um, we, I don't know if any of you guys heard, we just recently acquired Frog Logic. So that is bringing a whole new uh, sort of way of automated testing, uh, both at the hardware level and at, and at the application development level um, within the framework. So there, there's a lot of, a lot of different tools within it um, in terms of QA, in terms of full cycle support. Um, you know, Qt's been around for 25 years. We've got many devices in the field that are been around for 10, 15 years and, and getting maintained and updated. You'll see that with our 5.0 release on the upstream Qt, we've got two long-term support versions. With Qt 6.0 more recently released, Qt 6.2 will be our first LTS version. And on MCU, as we kind of drive towards version 2.0, that'll kind of be when we go into long-term support mode. So we've been gradually getting better at um, providing the backwards compatibility as this thing's been growing and gaining maturity. Um, and we're now sort of at a point where uh, we have a lot better parity with the APIs with the upstream and we're looking at, okay, long-term support going forward as we continue to add stuff. Um, the guarantees will be put in place that it will work with your pre-existing code as that's always been a focus. Um, Okay, let, we have so many questions here and so little time. So, yeah. um, Matthew, I don't know if you've had a chance to read through and if there's any yeah, yeah. that apply. Okay. Yeah, so uh, one here, um, so one is, uh, can you elaborate the feature to set uh, FPS and bit depth on your component? Um, so if, if you look at, um, there's, it's the layer component, um, uh, there's, uh, for, uh, there's a refresh interval um, is what you set to set kind of the refresh rate. And then there's also a depth. Um, and uh, you can set the item layer depth. So like, for instance, you can say uh, item layer dot uh, BBP16, I will set it to a 16 bit there. So uh, if you look for item layer uh, QML type, you can find out more information on that one. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and that's done in, in QML, right? So it's it's rather it's as straightforward as setting um, putting putting a component of your application within a layer, a type, and that there's a property for for those two values. So um, here's one. Any word about animations and videos on MCU? Um, feels like a spoiler alert. There there are for sure some example applications um, being cooked up within R and D on things like streaming video. It's a great use case, obviously for things like, um, backup cams, uh, you know, there's all kinds of applications in IOT, right? You walk up to your thermostat and the doorbell camera is streaming to it. And so, you know, those, those definitely, those use cases are within our mind and, uh, really right now the roadmap is largely being driven by customer demand as we've sort of knocked off some of the core, um, primitives and components, but, uh, stay tuned for more on that. Um, yeah, and it, yeah, some uh, hardware platforms also have hardware layers for video, so you can render to uh, one, one layer there um, and take advantage of that hardware layer feature that we mentioned. Yeah, I know there's a good um, white paper out there, uh, or app note rather, I guess, with NXP, where they dive into on the RT1170 platform, um, how you can kind of leverage the multiple accelerators they have. So VG Lite and PXP together um, to, to do some interesting stuff exactly like that with streaming video. Where can we sign up for an evaluation? That's my favorite question. You can either come talk to me directly, harrison.donahue at qt.io, um, or you can go to our q for mcus page and click try QT. Um, you can actually do that on any of the Qt product pages because uh, when you sign up for an evaluation, um, I believe that you are signing up for an evaluation of everything. Um, so you can reach out to us directly uh, through the contact us. You can click the download button. There's a number of different ways to get it. Let's see. Is there a plan to support FPGA-based microprocessor systems, Intel's? Uh, so we do have um, two customers that have ported to um, the Xilinx UltraScale Plus. Um, that is going to become a supported platform for us going in the future. Um, 
so if you guys want more details on that or you want to investigate what that supports looks like, I would, again, recommend that you reach out to us. So there's one question here. Um, do you uh, recommend having a separate MCU for just the UX? Um, uh, uh, in particular for demanding interfaces? Uh, this one is kind of, it's a hard one to answer because it will really depend on how much your app needs to do. Um, uh, what I tend to do uh, when I'm kind of approaching these kind of things is ask, um, uh, kind of how much CPU basically the um, the device needs to run. So if it's say it's kind of thirty percent, then we um, modify the the UI to kind of fit in that side. Uh, if you have you know the cost to do uh, multiple MCUs, that's a possibility too. Um, I've seen that uh, in multiple kind of uh, situations uh, more so you have an MPU with your the display and the MCU is in, in the back end, uh, but yeah, there, you can split it up as well. It really depends on how much processing you have to do, um, and you you probably would if you have an existing product you you roughly know um, how much processing your general tasks need, um, so you can probably quickly figure that out. All right, here's another one. Uh, is there any plans to partner and offer a generic dev kit, including a reference hardware? Um, I love this question. This is a great question. I think one of the challenges around deploying to MCUs is how specific every piece of hardware is, um, not only in terms of whether there's hardware acceleration, but your peripherals to your display, um, flash and RAM, internal, external. Um, and so the, you know, we've gone forward and supported a number of different vendors uh, right from NXP and ST and Renaissance um, to make the process kind of as painless as possible uh, when porting to something more custom. We have a very thorough um, porting, uh, porting guide, great reading material. You guys can go to um, the MCU docs page. Um, it has everything from setting up your build environment with CMake to um, uh, the, all of the, the function subs and classes that need to be filled in in order to get your stuff up on the screen. Um, and then uh, sort of how to maintain that going forward as new versions of Keep for MCU are released. Um, so yeah, I would encourage you guys to, to, to read through that, to try to understand kind of what the level of effort would be on your side. Um, but again, with a commercial license, um, you've, we have partners like ICS that can help you with that. And then we have our own team internally, and then we have our um, customer success team. So you're kind of covered from many different angles in terms of the support um, on getting your custom hardware up and running. All right, looks like we have a few minutes uh, left, so we can take one or two more questions. So one question here is kind of uh, um, talking about what, what uh, when we can see some more features in, uh, maybe you can uh, talk to what we have in uh, 1.9 coming up. Uh, sure. Let me um, put my full uh, roadmap disclaimer on that. These features are subject to change at no notice at all. <laughs> um, but uh, no, so some of the things that we're looking for uh, or looking forward to in 1.9 um for those of you who are uh, have not seen the release announcement for 1.8, I'll touch on those first. Um, we made a couple efforts uh, towards the RAM reduction, so supporting 8-bit color graphics. Um, and then as Matthew touched on, uh, font data within the flash memory, as well as vector graphics, if your hardware supports it, um, such as the RT1170. Um, we did add the QQuick, the QQuick Shapes API um, to do path and fill operations, and that's that falls into the vector graphics bucket. Um, we also recognize that you don't want to do all of your development in Qt Creator, and so we are making a strong effort to get um, so as much of your workflow in regards to the backend application development back into the vendor tooling. Um, we took a step forward with that by allowing you to build Qt Quick Ultralight applications as static libraries. Um, and then we added some more platform support. So in 1.9, you're going to see some more support for automotive-based platforms, um, such as the, as the Infineon uh, Treveo 2, um, uh, full layer support for the um, RT1170 from NXP, vector graphics on the Renaissance RH850, um, more support for complex scripts and bi-directional text, um, 
so being able to font quality control, being able to adjust the rasterization quality of glyphs uh, with one bit per pixel and no anti-aliasing to lower the memory requirements. Um, we'll also open up the development, um, the host application development on Linux. So right now, um, MCU development is on Windows only uh, with QCreator that we're looking to open that up at, um, uh, with Linux. And then we'll release that camera example I was kind of teasing um, with the um, with images from a camera and streaming video. Uh, what, I can answer one quick one here. Uh, there's a, do you have device emulation? So there is um, a desktop um, uh, kit that you can have. Um, uh, it's a 32 uh, pixel uh, thing. Um, so I have that. It's uh, pretty quick to you know um, run your app on the desktop. But since everything's integrated too, like I was, uh, you know, when I first started, I was using uh, an XP RT 1064, and it was very easy to flash to the device. It just takes, you know, a minute or two, uh, not a minute or two, kind of a minute longer kind of thing to do. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, both ways are kind of fast way. All right, great. Looks like we're just about out of time today. So thanks everyone for attending. Any of the questions we did not get a chance to get to uh, on this live webinar, we will do our best to follow up afterwards. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Harrison, and thank you, Matthew. It was very informative. I uh, wish we had some more time here today. Um, and we thanks everyone for coming. And like I said, keep an eye out for the webinar on demand uh, and the slides, which will be coming tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day, everybody.